Hi, my name is Emily Marcourt, and today I'm going to be talking to you about German idealism. So, a little bit of background history on German idealism. It was a movement in German philosophy. It began in the 1780s and lasted until the 1840s. German idealism can be traced back to the transcendental idealism of Immanuel Kant. German idealism developed from Immanuel Kant's work from the 1780s and 1790s. German idealism is linked with Romanticism and the revolutionary politics of the Enlightenment. German idealism has systematic treatments of all major parts of philosophy, which include logic, metaphysics, epistemology, moral and political philosophy, and aesthetics. Kant's transcendental idealism was a modest philosophical doctrine about the difference between the appearance of things and the things in themselves, which claimed that the objects of human cognition are just appearances and not actual things themselves. Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel all radicalized this view, transforming Kant's transcendental idealism into absolute idealism, which states that things in themselves are a contradiction because a thing must be an object of our consciousness if it is to be an object at all. So the Enlightenment took place in the 18th century. It was known as the Great Age of Reason. It was a period of rigorous scientific, political, and philosophical discourse. It was the, re the reaction to the rise and successes of modern science in the 16th and 17th centuries. The achievements of Newton in particular engendered widespread confidence and optimism about the power of human reason to control nature and to improve human life. People began questioning why we need political or religious authorities to tell us how to live our lives or what to believe, if each of us has the capacity to figure these things out for ourselves. In Kant's essay titled, what is the Enlightenment? He expresses the Enlightenment faith in the inevitability of progress. He states how a few independent thinkers will gradually inspire a broader cultural movement, which will ultimately lead to a greater freedom of action and governmental reform. Kahn states that a culture of enlightenment is almost inevitable, if only there is freedom to make public use of one's reason in all matters. For some, it seems unclear whether progress would in fact ensue if reason enjoyed full sovereignty over traditional authorities, or whether unaided reasoning would instead lead straight into materialism, fatalism, atheism, skepticism, and the even libertinism and authoritarianism. The Enlightenment committed to the sovereignty of reason, which was tied to the expectation that it would not lead to any of these consequences, but instead would support certain beliefs, which included the belief in God, the soul and freedom in the compatibility of science with morality and religion. Even though everyone did not believe in these things, the Enlightenment was not radical. The Enlightenment was about replacing traditional authorities with the authority of individual human reason. Even though it was not about overturning traditional and moral and religious beliefs, the inspiration for it was still new physics. If nature is governed by mechanistic, casual laws, there is no room for freedom or a soul or anything but matter and motion. This threatened the traditional view that morality requires freedom and that we must be free in order to choose what is right over what is wrong, because otherwise we cannot be held responsible. It also threatened the traditional religious beliefs in a soul that can survive death or be resurrected in an afterlife. The Enlightenment and modern science threatened to undermine traditional moral and religious beliefs that free rational thought was expected to support. German idealism grew out of the crisis of the Enlightenment, which resulted in Kant writing the critique of pure reason at the end of the Enlightenment. So some of the famous figures of German idealism are Immanuel Kant, Frederick Jacobi, Karl Reinhold, Gottlob Schulze, Johann Fichte, Georg Hegel, Frederick Schelling, and some other notable figures are Arthur Schopenhauer, Soren Kierkegaard, and Karl Marx. So the first person I'm going to talk about today is Immanuel Kant. He was born on April 22nd, 1724, and he died on February 12th, 1804. He was a German philosopher who was responsible for the production of early modern rationalism and empiricism. And he set the terms for the 19th and 20th century philosophy. Kant also argued that knowledge is con constituted by the sensible contents derived from the object of cognition and the a priori forms in the faculties of the mind. He has three critiques, the critique of pure reason, the critique of practical reason, and the critique of the power of judgment. 
He was born into an artisan family of modest means. His father was a harness maker, his, and his mother was a well-educated daughter of a harness maker. He very rarely went without during his childhood. However, his father's trade started to decline during his childhood, which made his parents at times have to rely on extended family for financial support. He attended a pietist school from the ages of 8 to 15. The school emphasized concepts such as conversion, reliance on divine grace, the experience of religious emotions, and personal devotion involving regular Bible study, prayer, and introspection. Kant reacted strongly against these ideas. In response, Kant sought refuge in the Latin classics. He attended college at the University of Königsberg, known as the Albertina, where his early interest in the classics was quickly suppressed by philosophy, which encomp encompassed all of mathematics and physics, as well as logic, metaphysics, ethics, and natural law. At the university, his professors exposed him to the approach of Christian Wolff, Kant's favorite professor was Martin Knudsen, who was introduced Kant to the work of Isaac Newton, his, and his influence is visible in Kant's first published work titled Thoughts on the True Estimation of Living Forces, which was a critical attempt to mediate a dispute in natural philosophy between Leibnizians and Newtonians over the proper measurement of force. After college, Kant spent six years as a tutor, and a year later he began teaching at the Albertina. For the next four decades, he taught philosophy up until his retirement. In the years that followed, he went on to publish a variety of different works. In 1762, Kant published the only possible argument in support of a demonstration of the existence of God, which is a book which Kant expanded on his earlier work in the universal history and his work in the new education to develop the argument that God's existence is a condition of the internal possibility while criticizing other arguments for God's existence. In 1770, he wrote a Latin dissertation titled Concerning the Form and Principles of the Sensible and Intelligible World, which was known as the Inaugural Dissertation. Kant argues that sensibility and understanding are directed at two different worlds. Sensibility gives us access to the sensible world, while understanding it enables us to grasp a distinct intelligible world. These two worlds are related and that what the understanding grasps at in the intelligible world is the paradigm of monumental perfection, which is a common measure for all other things in far as their realities. His embrace of Platonism in the inaugural dissertation did not last long. He soon after denied that our understanding is capable of insight into an intelligible world, which led towards his, pos his position in the Critique of Pure Reason in 1781 in which he states that the understanding supplies forms that shape our ex experience of the sensible world to which human knowledge is limited, while the intelligible world is strictly unknowable to us. In 1788, the Critique of Practical Reason discussed topics in moral philosophy, and the Critique of Power of Judgment was published in 1790, which deals with aesthetics and teleology and it argues that human understanding is the source of the general laws of nature that structure all of our experiences and human reason gives itself the moral law, which is the basis for our belief in God, freedom, and morality. With these works, Kant secured international fame in German philosophy in the late 1780s. In 1790, he announced that the critique of power of judgment would be his last work. Kant's works bridged the two philosophical schools of thought in the 18th century. Rationalism, which held that knowledge could be obtained by reason alone prior to an experience, and empiricism, which stated that knowledge could be obtained only through the senses. So, Immanuel Kant came up with a solution. That solution was that while we could know particular facts about the world from our sensory experiences, our mind has a priority form, which is classified as principles to organize sensory contents. Now, therefore, knowledge is gained by sensory contents in which we gain from experience and the forms which are built into the mechanism of the mind. Kant stated that knowledge is made up of the sensory content supplied by said object or the priori forms of the departments of the mind. Then the things considered themselves like God, the world, and the soul are in principle unknowable since none of them can be supplied by sensible contents. The position that the forms of the mind are considered a priori conditions of the possibility of knowledge was termed by Kant as transcendental idealism, which separated it from the earlier forms of idealism, such as George Berkeley's. George Berkeley's idealism stated that we can only directly know the ideas in our minds, not the objects as they appear to be. 
Berkeley went on to develop subjective realism, which Kant argued by stating that objects are empirically real and transcendentally ideal. Kant says that the reason for this is that human knowledge about said object is a constitution of the imperial and the ideal. Kant then says that the mind plays a central role in influencing the way an individual experiences the world. According to Kant, we perceive the phenomena through time, space, and the different categories of understanding. And those categor categories of understanding are quality, relation, quantity, and modality. So the next person is Frederick Jacobi, and he was a German philosopher, and he was born on January 25th in 1743 in Dusseldorf, Germany, and he died on March 10th, 1819 in Munich, Germany. And in the year 1787, he published a book, and it was titled David Hume on Faith or Idealism and Realism, a Dialogue. And in this book, he addressed Kant's concept of a thing in itself. The dialogue appeared in light of the publishing of the second edition of Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. It had an appendix which severely criticized Kant's idea of transcendental idealism. Jacobi agreed with him that the objective thing in itself is not able to be directly known. However, he did state that it must be taken on faith. Jacobi stated, without the presupposition of the thing in itself, I was unable to enter Kant's system, but with it, I was unable to stay within it. Jacobi felt in presuppositioning the allegedly known thing in itself by assigning it to many functions that it played in his system. Kant was, in fact, demonstrating knowledge of it, thereby contradicting his assumption of critical ignorance. Jacobi stated that a subject must believe there is a real object in the external world that is related to the representation or mental idea that is directly known. This belief is the result of revelation or immediately not known, but logically unproved truth. Jacobi felt the real existence of a thing in itself is revealed or disclosed to the observing subject. Here, the subject directly knows the ideal subjective representations that appear in their mind and believes that the real objective thing in itself, in itself exists outside of the mind. Jacobi attempted to legitimize this belief and its theological associations by presenting the external world as an object of faith. So the next fellow is Karl Reinhold, and he was born on October 26, 1757 in Vienna, Austria. He died on April 10, 1823 in Kiel, Germany. He is an Austrian philosopher, and he helped to make the work of Immanuel Kant well known. He helped to influence German idealism through his elementary philosophy. In 1790 and 1792, in the German Mercury, Karl published the letters concerning the Kantian philosophy. These letters provided a clear explanation of Kant's thoughts, which were previously inaccessible due to Kant's use of complex and technical language. He skipped Kant's arguments on the theory of knowledge and stated or started his explanation from the last section of Kant's critique of pure reason, which covered the topics of God, soul, and freedom. He began to have doubts about the completeness of Kant's philosophy and the soundness of its theoretical foundations and the quality of Kant's own arguments and deductions. From there, Reinhold took it upon himself to come up with his own more systematic, well-grounded, and universally acceptable version of the new critical philosophy. This developed into his elementary philosophy. Reinhold introduced his philosophy with the questions of how is philosophy possible as a strict science and what is the distinguishing feature of the science? Following in Kant's footsteps, Reinhold kept that the essence of science lies in universality and necessity. But these are just properties of thought, not of sensation or intuition. Reinhold believed only through thinking and judging can we recognize universality and necessity, formulated and expressed in concepts and propositions. The idea of the philosophy was to establish universal, universally valid propositions in a manner that allows their, their necessity and universality to be universally recognized as binding upon everyone. This is the last requirement that shows the correlation between Reinhold's efforts at popularizing Kant's philosophy. Now, the next person we have is Gottlob Schulze, and he was a German philosopher. He was born on August 23, 1761, in Heldrungen, Germany. He died in, on January 14th in 1833 in Göttingen, Germany. 
Gottlob was a well-known critic of Immanuel Kant. He pointed out the inconsistencies in Kant's arguments. Those were that a mental idea or representation must be of something external to the mind, which is empirically real. While Kant held the empirical realist thesis, he also argued that the forms of understanding, such as the principle of cause and effect. Anonymously, he wrote, if the law of cause and effect only applies to the phenomena in the mind and not between the phenomena and any things in themselves outside of the mind, then the thing in itself cannot be the cause of an idea or image of a thing in the mind. So Schultze discredited Kant's philosophy by using Kant's own reasoning to prove Kant's concept of the thing in itself false. Now, the next person is Johann Fichte, and he was born on May 19th in 1762 in Rama, New Germany. He died on January 29th, 1814 in Berlin, Germany, and he was another German philosopher. Now, after Schultze had come in and criticized Kant's concept of a thing in itself, Johann Fichte came in and produced his own philosophy that was somewhat similar to Kant's, but he removed the concept of a thing in itself from his philosophy. The point of his philosophy was to explain how free willingly, moral, responsible agents can at the same time be considered part of a world of casually conditioned material objects in space and time. His strategy for answering this question was to begin with the ungrounded assertion of the subjective spontaneity and freedom of the I and then proceed to a transcendental derivation of objective necessity and limitation as a condition necessary for the possibility of the former. Fichte stated that our representations, ideas, or mental images are just productions of our ego or knowing subject. Fichte believed that there is no external thing in itself that produces the ideas. He said that the cause of the external thing was the knowing subject or ego. Fichte's, I, Fichte's style was a challenging extension of Kant's difficult writing. Fichte claimed that his truths were evident to intellectual, non-perceptual intuition. The next person is Frederick Schelling. And he was a German philosopher, and he was born on January 27th, 1775, in Leonberg, Germany. He died August 20th, 1854, in Bagregaz, Switzerland. Schelling, along with Johann Fichte and Georg Hegel, is one of the most influential thinkers in the tradition of German idealism. He claimed the that the ideas or mental images in the mind are identical to the extended objects which are external to the mind. Schelling's absolute identity asserted that there is no difference between the subjective and objective or the ideal and the real. The tension in Schelling's philosophy, which set the agenda for most of his subsequent work, came from the need to overcome the perceived lack in Kant's philosophy of a substantial account of how nature and freedom came to coexist. His earlier works attempt to give a new account of nature while taking account of the fact that Kant had changed the status of nature in modern philosophy. In the critique of pure reason, nature is largely seen as the formal sense, which is subject to necessary laws. Kant argues that these laws are only acceptable to us because cognition depends on the subject bringing forms of thought, the categories, to bear on what it perceives. The problem with this is that it leads to how the subject could fit into a nature conceived of deterministic terms, given that the subject's ability to know is dependent upon its spontaneous, self-caused ability to judge in terms of the categories. Now, Kant came up with a response to this, and that response was to split the senses, or the senses realm of nature as law-bound appearance from the intelligible realm of the subject's cognitive and ethical self-determination. Now, if the subject is part of nature, there would seem to be no way of explaining how a nature, which we can only know as deterministic, can give rise to a subject which seems to transcend determinism in its knowing and self-determined actions. In the critique of judgment, Kant wanted to bridge the realms of necessity and spontaneity. He did so by suggesting that nature itself could be seen in more than formal terms and that it also produces self-determining organisms and gives rise to disinterested aesthetic pleasure in the subject that 
contemplates the forms. Now, two problems still remained. Kant gave no account of the genesis of the subject that transcends its status as a piece of determined nature, and such an account would have to be able to bridge the divide between nature and freedom. In the 1780s and 1790s, two ways out of Kantian dualism presented themselves. One being Kant's arguments about the division between appearances and things in themselves, which gave rise to the problem of how knowing in itself could give rise to the appearances for what the subject might overcome by rejecting the notion of the thing in itself altogether. If what we know about the object is the product of the, the spontaneity and the I, an idealist could argue that the whole of the world's intelligibility is therefore the result of the activity of the subject, and that the new account of subjectivity is required which would achieve what Kant had failed to achieve. And the second being that nature gives rise to self-determining subjectivity, which would suggest that a modest account of nature, which was more than a concatenation of laws and was in some ways inherently subjective, would offer a different way of accounting for what Kant's conception did not provide. Schelling sought out answers to the Kantian problems in terms that relate to both of these conceptions. So the last person I'm going to talk about really in depth today is Georg Hegel. He was a German philosopher. He was born on August 27th in 1770 in Stuttgart, Germany. He died November 14th, 1831 in Berlin, Germany. He is well known for his teleological account of history. He also responded to Kant's philosophy by suggesting that the unsolvable contradictions given by Kant and his critique of pure reason applied not only to the four areas Kant gave, but in all objects and conceptions and notions and ideas. Hegel believed that abstract thought is limited, so he went on to consider how historical formations give rise to different philosophies and ways of thinking. He also believed that thought fails when it is only given an abstraction and is not united with considerations of historical reality. Hegel went on to publish a major work titled The Phenomenology of Spirit. In this work, he traced the formation of self-consciousness through history and the importance of other people in the awakening of self-consciousness. All throughout his writings, he attempted to elaborate a comprehensive and systematic philosophy from a logical starting point. The German idealism movement ultimately ended with Hegel's death. The end of German idealism happened in Berlin, Germany, and it took place in the 1840s. Now, Fichte had spent his later years reformulating the Wise and Schaffler in his teaching in hopes to finally find an audience that understood him. Hegel, who took over for Fichte after his death, lectured on the history of philosophy, the philosophy of history, the history of religion, and the philosophy of fine art. Hegel gained a considerable following among both conservatives and liberals in Berlin, who came to be known as right and left Hegelians. Schelling's views changed the most between the turn of the century and his arrival in Berlin. The positive philosophy he articulated in his late works is no longer idealist, because Schelling no longer maintains that being and thinking are identical. Instead, he says, thought must find its ground in the predominant kind of all being. Arthur Schopenhauer, Soren Kierkegaard and Karl Marx all witnessed the decline of German idealism in Berlin. Schopenhauer had studied with Schultz and attended Fichte's lectures in Berlin, although he is not considered a German idealist by many. Some historians have argued against this exclusion, suggesting that the first edition of the world as will and representation is, in fact, the first completely post-Kantian philosophical system there is some dispute as to whether or not the system is really idealist. In the second part of the world as will and representation, Schopenhauer claims that the representations of the pure subject of cognition are grounded in the will and ultimately in the body. Marx, along with another one of Schelling's students, Frederick Engels, came to deride idealism as the German ideology. Marx and Engels stated that idealism has never really broken with religion that it comprehended the world through abstract logical categories, and finally, that it mistook mere ideas, ideas for real things. Marx and Engels promoted their own historical materialism as an alternative to the ideology of idealism. 
rise of empirical methods in the natural sciences and historical critical methods in the human sciences, as well as the growth of neo-Kantianism and positivism, or the scientific study of the social world, that led to the eclipse of the German idealism. Neo-Kantianism in particular sought to leave behind the speculative excesses of German idealism and the extract from Kant the ideas that were useful for the philosophy of the natural and human sciences. In the process, they established Neo-Kantianism as the dominant philosophical school in Germany at the end of the 19th century. Despite its general decline, German idealism remained an important influence on the British idealism of F.H. Bradley and Bernard Bassequet. At the beginning of the 20th century, the rejection of British idealism was one of the common features of early analytic philosophy. The belief that German idealism was at least partly responsible for German nationalism and aggression was common among philosophers of that generation. Now, it would be difficult to prove that any particular philosophy was responsible for German nationalism or the rise of fascism, but it is true that the works of Fichte and Hegel were favorite references for the German nationalists. The works of the German idealists became important in, the Fr in France during the 1930s. Lectures by Hegel, lectures on Hegel by Alexander Kojev went on to influence a generation of French intellectualists. So just to summarize a little bit here, German idealism was a movement in German philosophy. It began in the 1780s and lasted until the 1840s. It grew out of the Enlightenment, and Immanuel Kant argued that the human understanding is the source of the general laws of nature that structure all of our experiences, and that human reason gives itself the moral law, which is our basis for belief in God, freedom, and immorality. Frederick Jacobi criticized Kant's transcendental idealism. He agreed that the thing in itself is not able to be directly known, but stated it must be taken on faith. Karl Reinhold helped to spread Kant's ideas and helped to influence German idealism through his elementary philosophy. Gottlob Schultz used Kant's own reasoning against him to prove his concept of a thing in itself is false. Johann Fichte believe that the images are just productions of our ego. Georg Hegel is known for his teleological account of history and believed abstract thought is limited. And Frederick Schelling claimed that the ideas or mental images in the mind are identical to the extended objects which are external to the mind. Here is the first page of references that I used for this project. And here is the second page of references that were used in this project.